Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious today. A very special program, as you see sitting beside me, is Kevin Holstrasser. Kevin, welcome to Stay Curious. Well, thank you for the invitation. Well, it's special because this is one of the gentlemen that knows everything, or a lot, let's say, about this engine behind us here. The what is considered one of the best rocket engines ever made in the world, the Space Shuttle main engine, SSME. It's now called the RS-25 in the Artemis world. But, uh, Kevin, we're happy to have you here. You've got a beautiful model that he's made. What do you all see this? A 3D model we're going to talk about. And we're going to get a little history lesson about the SSMEs. And from one of the, the horse's mouth, so to speak, one of the men that, that uh, I guess, helped pioneer it to, to develop it. Well, I, some, of the, some of the development, but what I'm, I need to say is I'm humbled and honored to be here, first of all, because there are so many other smart rocketdyne people in this area, even on your board, who are better suited to do this than I am. Mm -hmm. There's well, people... you see how desperate we get sometimes. Well, no, Lee Solid is, a, is an <laughs> icon in the SSME world. Absolutely. Uh, the, my, these are all my mentors. John Plowden, who knows more about this engine than, than ever. Uh, Eric Garzi, uh, Dan Hausman. Dan Hausman is uh, one of the smartest people I know, and he's, he could, uh, he's one of the actually people who really helped design and implement this and whenever there was a problem, it's people like Dan Hausman and all these other people who, who uh, I got to work with and who are much smarter than I am mm -hmm. to do this. So again, I'm humbled to do this because there are so many folks who you could put in this chair. Well, we're glad you're here. Hold that up in front of you there. What he's referring to is this beautiful 3D model of the Space Shuttle main engine. And uh, we're going to go over that in a little bit of detail here in a minute. Uh, built on your uh, 3D printer at your home, huh? Well, I've, I actually uh, had most of this contracted out. And, uh, oh, okay. And, but I designed it. I've designed it. Uh, of course, Hold it up. Like, right here, let me show it. Like because that. I have, uh, I had access to the drawings of the Space Shuttle main engine through my career. And uh, who'd like to have this in their space cave, huh? Yeah, Sitting on yeah. the coffee table. Yeah. Very lightweight. Well, it's, 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 I can tell very professionally done, this 3D model there. That is really something. That's what Kevin. I did in my, did in my retirement. Good. Well, we're going to talk uh, to Kevin about this engine uh, and how it has segued into the, uh, the moon rocket, SLS. Um, we, uh, of course, we're going to, uh, as I ask you a little bit about uh, uh, where you grew up and so forth, We've got uh, some pictures courtesy of Carlton Bailey. Thank you, Carlton. He put this triple header together there. Of course, the blue diamonds of those engines there. You're going to tell us that signature and, and how happy you were always to see that, I'm sure. Well, we call those mock cones. The official, mock cones. The okay. official term for those. M-A-C-H? M-A-C-H. Cones, yeah, okay. Ernst, Ernst well, I won't call them blue diamonds anymore, Marty. My way to say hi to Marty Winkle that worked on the launch process systems. I couldn't separate him and Kevin uh, much as they're in here talking about uh, what's going on. And uh, oh, sorry there, your name got misspelled there. It's S-S-E-R. And uh, there you go. But we did our best. Thank you, Trekkie Techie there. Uh, but uh, Kevin, so much more than that title there. We couldn't get everything in there. But hi, Marty. As you're writing down some of our uh, friends' names there, say hello to everybody on our UCAC family microphone. Hello, Mark and Kevin and, and everybody else. Good. How do you know Kevin so well? We were kind of, I guess, counterparts. He worked for Rocket Iron on the main engines, and I was a um, main engine controller engineer for, back then was Rockwell International. Mm -hmm. So we, we were counterparts. Great. Of course, we're proud of Rock, uh, Marty working on the as an electrical engineer on our lunar modules that will be celebrating the 54th anniversary of Apollo mm -hmm. 11 here in a couple of weeks. Uh, time flies, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, away. As well as the 12th anniversary of the last SSMEs operating on a shuttle is coming yeah. up here, too. So I don't want to make you feel old there, Kevin, but uh, hard to hide the gray hair at our age. Yeah. <laughs> but as, we're, as I ask you, where would you grow up? Well, I grew up in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, soon, uh, just a little bit before I finished high school, I moved to Florida on my own mm -hmm. and uh, put myself through college at the University of Central Florida. Excellent. And upon graduation, I graduated college just in time, just before STS-2. 
Mm -hmm. And I came over here to the Space Center with a handful of resumes and walked around trying to see who would talk to me. And I also, my dad worked at Vandenberg Air Force Base at the time, and I shipped him some. And I was not able to find a job, but my dad was able to get me an interview at Vandenberg. Hmm. So I actually joined the space program and opened up the uh, office for SRBs at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, worked a hydraulic APU system uh, for USBI, the SRBs, and then transferred to Rockwell Space Division out there in 1983. And uh, worked... Uh, Worked for Rockwell Space Division when we were trying to launch uh, shuttles from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, after a short time, I wrote software for the firing room. And uh, I, after they finished that, my job was complete. The firing room software was complete. And since I had just finished writing the uh, software for the C-12 and the C-3 consoles, the SSME consoles, I was actually offered a job to transfer from Space Division into the Rocketdyne Division by uh, a mentor of mine, Vince Wheelock, mm -hmm. who was basically has become the uh, historian, unofficial historian for Rocketdyne. And so that's why I picked up so much information. Vince Wheelock. Yeah, mm -hmm. another, another hero of the space program. And uh, after Challenger, after Air Force decided they did not want to launch space shuttles anymore, uh, I actually was invited to come to Florida by Eric Garzi and Lee Solid and John Plowden to... Uh, become a part of the launch team here. And that's when I met Marty, worked at avionics for a number of years. Uh, worked, then I transferred into uh, the flow management, flow leadership, where I was the, the tail lead, where my job was to plan the requirements for the next, for a mission. So I followed basically one orbiter, the discovery vehicle. And did that, just kind of... Yeah, and just you know. in, even in between what, what engines we're going to use, what work needed to be on what work we had to do on the engine before it was ready for flight and do all the pre-ops for that, interface that with the other contractors on the site. And then I got an, an opportunity to join the uh, safety and quality team at Rocketdyne. So I uh, worked safety and quality for a number of years for Rocketdyne. And in the meantime, Rocketdyne had been merged into Boeing. So an opportunity came in the early 2000s to uh, transition from a Boeing Rocketdyne op, uh, job to safety and quality for Boeing the site, the the site leadership. So I was uh, re represented safety and quality for all the Boeing and Heritage Rockwell Rocketdyne teams. And after a number of years, I became chief engineer for Boeing at the site. Mm -hmm. And in 2007, I became the program manager for the uh, Florida Space Operations, since Boeing was the in Rockwell were the original equipment manufacturers for the orbiter, we this team I worked with were responsible for all the engineering on the orbiter. We still own the orbiter as original equipment manufacturers, and we would be re re responsible for make sure all the engineering done on the vehicle was per per print and per drawing. Mm -hmm. And a year later, I at Boeing you always had to have two jobs. Okay. So I had a part-time job as the senior site executive for Boeing Florida Operations, which represented uh, all the Boeing uh, contracts and personnel here at the Space Center at the time, which at the time was fairly large. But over time, Rocketdyne was sold to Pratt Whitney. The Delta II, Delta II, three and four folks were merged into ULA. And, and of course, uh, at the end of the contracts, and the shuttle came, came to an end, but in my career. I thought a lot of the careers, but uh, yeah, at one point, you uh, from your notes, you're, you're over 900 Boeing personnel. Well, we had, we had uh, almost had that many engineers. Engineers? We had around 1,400 uh, employees huh. before all the, the vestitures. What a career, folks. Now, when you were uh, in Dayton, Ohio, there, uh, you were close to Wright-Patterson Air Force mm -hmm. Base, of course. And, of course, down the road was the Cincinnati Big Red Machine, too, down there. Yeah, and so, that, more uh, importantly, just north of us was Wapakoneta, Ohio. Yeah, right. And, and my where Neil Armstrong grew up in Finley, Ohio, about two hours north of you is where I grew up mm -hmm. in there. Did you did you play at Estes Rockets or anything like that? Where did this come from, your uh, uh, affinity to be uh, around rockets? It's hard to pinpoint it, but I do remember my father got us up every morning for a space launch. Mm -hmm. And it was just kind of osmosis, but I just always kind of knew in the back of my head, I wanted to be in the space business. Now, how were you going to see a space launch back in the last century? On TV, on TV. Oh, God. On yeah. TV, yeah, yeah. I mean, we didn't do uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, uh, 
the, of course, the crude ones we're talking about mostly mm -hmm. then. And yeah, I, mean, I was fascinated by that, but uh, I uh, had to work hard to, uh, to achieve the grades to get into engineering. And like I said, I always knew that I would somehow get into the space program. That's neat. That's neat. I, I was crazy about astronauts and, uh, and telescopes. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, I, got, I did a wrong turn. I tell people, do not go into liberal arts. All right, because I wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein oh, uh, at okay. Watergate, and I went as a newspaper reporter. Go into engineering like this man, and and uh, 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 part of it was, uh, uh, you know, just esoteric things going on there. Well, we're talking here with Ken uh, Hostrosser. He uh, has had a great career involved with the space shuttle main engines. We got this picture of Carlton Bailey's here in our background where we were getting your fabulous bio there. Okay, and that is the uh, the uh, the cones, the mock cones, mock yes. cones. All right, I'll I'll, I'll have to. I'm going to start now. using the word uh, blue diamonds. I like that too. Oh well, no, <laughs> don't don't change for me. That'd be horrible. But we're but we're looking up here at a uh, the couple. There's there's Dan Hausman. Hi, Dan. Uh, he's been on our Stay Curious program. And uh, one of your uh, colleagues, mentors, too. Mentors. Dan Hausman is, there's so many. He is a very smart man, I, I know. In fact, I think that's why you had to get out of Rocketdyne and into Boeing, because <laughs> Rocketdyne had so many smart people. And it was very humiliating and humbling for me to always be the dumbest one in the room. Well, what what makes him smart? And then here's Lee Sal. We want to Lee give Sal. a shout out to Lee mm -hmm. there. I mean, is it their, it's not their vast book knowledge, is it? Is it or is it there? Well, yes, it was. Okay. It was their vast book knowledge. Their, and a lot of these people, uh, they were they were a generation. They were, they actually took part in the program before the shuttle started, so they knew that the more the development and and the, how the engine worked. My experience from how the engine worked came from sitting with these people, sitting up and and listening to everything they said. But Dan Hausman could digest and understand a, a problem, a systems problem. When you're in the rocket science business, it's just not one discipline. You have to understand many disciplines mm -hmm. to get to the core of an issue, whether it doesn't have to be a catastrophic issue, but just a little funny data you see in an engine test. Dan and Eric Garzi, Jim Chilton, the current, uh, I think, technical leader out there for Rocket Time right now is a gentleman named Bill Muddle. They were all able to sit there and just digest and, and pinpoint a problem. John Plowden used to always tell us, Never turn your back on a rocket motor Ooh, because yeah. he would know it goes from really good to really bad in just a couple of milliseconds. Milliseconds. And then you said something earlier in our pre-production meeting here. The hardware talks to you. Yeah, that's another thing that John Plowden and Dan Hausman would always tell us. You know, the hardware is always talking to you, so you got to look at the data. When, you, uh, when we would do engine tests, we would get reams and reams, and it would take us not hours, it take us weeks to, to go through the data and look for anything off dominal. And uh, sure enough, you, you know, you'd see data, but you'd say, you know, this data is within limits, but it's just not to where it was yesterday you know, or last time we tested it. And it wasn't, you know, it doesn't match really precisely. So pay attention to it. And so we learned, you know, because of our great mentors we had at Rocketdyne, we learned to pay attention to that, those details and don't ever let the piece of data, you know, not be answered. Kevin, something popped into my mind that one of our old unmanned rocket guys, Murphy Wardman, who's 91, always said that when we got a, a rocket uh, launching the, uh, the Convair General Dynamics uh, uh, Atlas rocket in the 60s, he said when we got a clean machine back from the factory, uh, the launch we had problems with. When it came back to the machine from the factory and we had to massage some pieces and parts and, and play with a little bit, the launch went flawless. I mean, is that a Murphy's Law or something of well, the rocket no, it, world? It's, again, it's, it's, a, it's an axiom and it's a fact in the rocket business that when they come to the launch site, some assembly is required. Okay. They come out of the uh, manual. They do a good job, but, uh, you know, they, they have specs and they, and they and they manufacture it properly, but there was some assembly required when we got here, and we would have to do some inspections, and and uh, I think when Marty and I used to work together, our job was to go out there and reroute the harnesses, and we would do a lot of extensive testing before it got here. Well, interesting. Marty, you've got, you're right, a lot of viewers that are watching this wonderful 
program. I'm excited to hear what Kevin's got to say. He's already enlightened us so much already. Uh, Marty, what's on your mind there, buddy? Kevin, you talked about reading the data. And one of the people that I've always been impressed by, he worked for Rockwell, then he went to Rockadyne, was Dick Carlson. And he used to line the walls up after a launch and just, back then it was strip chart recording. And he'd analyze every engine, every measurement. It would take him a few days to do that. You want to comment on Dick? Dick Carlson was a hero of the of the space shuttle main engine. He actually um, was an encyclopedia for us. He, he actually worked F1. <laughs> he was one of the folks who worked the F1 engine. F1 and engines on the Saturn V rocket. I got to interject yeah, some. Yeah, so he, he, was uh, a, he was one of our heroes. And he was, I want to say, like a guru. He would sit. He had his own little cubicle, and it was stacked. In those days, everything came out on computer paper, and all the data was just—it was just full of data. And we would see stacks. I mean, I used to go into his cubicle and sit on the stacks to talk with them. Carlson, and right? Dick Carlson. Dick Carlson. Dick Carlson. He's a local gentleman, and uh, he was one of those people that I described that people who were just so smart. But Dick used to do that. Remember, we used to go to the second floor of the LCC, and we'd have these strip charts, and we would go back to the hall hallway. And we would just roll them out. And these, these strip charts were literally 40 feet long. Wow. And we would go down sec millisecond by millisecond and look at the data. And Dick, Dick would look. And I, I wasn't very knowledgeable at the time. I was still up and coming in those days. But I used to watch Dick Carlson and some of these other gentlemen that I've talked about. And they would go and say, oh, what's, what's wrong with this? And my attitude at the time was, it's just been spec. Let's move on. Oh, no, no, no. There's, this is something to look at. And it gets back to don't let that don't you know, make sure you listen to the hardware because it's talking to you. Hmm. And Dick used to do that. And he would these people I've talked about, you know, this such heroes of mine. Uh, Dan Hausman hadn't moved down here to Florida yet, but Canoga Park was full of a number of people who used to be able to do the same thing. But uh, uh, Dick Carlson, uh, he had all the manuals from the Apollo program, and he he when you go, went to him, he would not only tell you what the problem was, he'd tell you how it was caused what to do about it, and he was very in, in, involved in what we called the pneumatic control assembly. It's just a minor part. I don't have it modeled here, but that would control all the purges, and he designed and modified that PCA to do so many things that it wasn't intended to do just by his imagination and, and his knowledge of how the engine worked as a system. Mm -hmm. He would explain these things as a matter of fact, right? It's just common knowledge. <laughs> it was far from common knowledge. Huh. And th that's why it was good to get out of rock time because I hated being <laughs> the dumbest guy in the room all the time. Talking about Dick Carlson, one of the, the rocket people there that uh, uh, built this um, incredible engine. We're seeing our green screen here in a test uh, at the facility in Stennis. And Kevin's going to talk, talk about that in a little bit. Uh, want to uh, get, uh, I'm going to have some slides that I'm going to breeze through there, everybody out there a little bit because... Uh, Dan and I met uh, a couple of weeks ago and arranged this uh, interview, and, and I've had a, a, a chance to get to know him a little bit. Uh, we did want to talk about Lee Solid there. I talked to Lee on the phone. He's doing well. He brags about this engine. The SSME is the highest performance engine ever built. Uh, specific, uh, he said the specific impulse. Yes. Nobody has, else has built an engine that has this powerful specific impulse. He said, Mark, think about it like miles per, per hour. Uh, uh, there are bigger engines, he said, they're not as efficient. The pounds per thrust, uh, pounds of thrust per pounds of fluid flow. Exactly. Is the secret. There. Pounds of thrust versus over, it's a ratio over the pounds of pounds per second so when you do the math the pounds cancel out and the number that's the an actual answer of that ratio comes out as seconds All so right. that's how you judge an engine's efficiency and uh its power well he said he's impressed that elon musk's engines those uh merlins have been used so efficiently and particularly flying that one uh, uh 16 times the other night uh the uh but he said that one of the SSME engines flew 14 times. But he's, he was an architect, of course, of the F-1 engines of the Saturn V rocket. But he's so proud to have a part of this reusable, reusable, folks, engine, which you told me there was uh, about uh, 40 of them in inventory. Well, it originally uh, manufactured over the, over the whole course of the program, 46 SSMEs were built. Okay. 
and uh, at the end of the shuttle program, 16 still existed. Over time, a lot of those, uh, we we're going to talk about engine testing. We just spent a lot of time engine testing. So a lot of them were consumed. Their life limit was expired through engine testing. A few of them were uh, used to test to, to destruction in some, kind of, in some tests. Some were museums. But after the shuttle, engine, uh, shuttle program ended, we had 16 left. And, of course, four have gone with the Artemis One. So that leaves us with 12 engines right now. All right, and those uh, four of those will be used on the Artemis II in November 2024, folks, so we, a year from now. And then, of course, we hope four of them will be used to take us to the moon uh, to land. Uh, they're going to pass by the moon on Artemis II in there. But uh, uh, there's a beautiful test stand there, okay. Uh, the mock cone there below it. I always love the, the, the looking at uh, right around the rim. And all this happening around there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you break it down in milliseconds, and there's quite a lot going on there, obviously. Uh, but let's go to just w about this engine, some of the dimensions. 14 feet tall, 7.5 feet wide. Um, the, uh, the, the data here I'm going to read, Dan, uh, Kevin, uh, uh, what sticks out to you there? That, that, that we space geeks should pay attention to this well, chart the, there. The, the number of the efficiency of, of the engine with 452 seconds of uh, impulse was really what made it special because a very efficient engine. Mm -hmm. But this engine, I don't see it there, but we, you know, you can't mess, forget that it's not only reusable, it's thr throttleable. Throttle. Throttleable, yeah. Try to say that. So you can adjust it, and we'll talk about that here, I think, a little bit. But it's a, it's a high pressure engine. That's what NASA wanted for the so it's got a high, termed a high pressure engine. It uh, is a fuel rich engine, which maybe we'll talk about later too. It's a kind of engine. And the propellants are hydrogen and oxygen. And that's why when you see that uh, flame, it's clear. But when mm -hmm. this thing just turns hydrogen and oxygen into some water. Hydrogen minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit, below zero, by the way. Um, of course, three SSMEs every in, every flight produced over 37 million pounds of horsepower, uh, which they say is the equivalent of 13 Hoover dams. I don't mm -hmm. know how, how long that ho those Hoover dams are running there. But in uh, the fuel pump that we're going to see, the, uh, the turbo pump generated 70,000 horsepower, uh, which was significant to its output there. So a um, few little facts there to, to whet your appetite. Uh, just quickly from post-flight inspection to get it to the next launch is this whole chain of things that uh, uh, I'm sure you were very involved it is, in. This Kevin. was part of my job for a little while. I would follow a flow like this around for discovery and, and coordinate all the planning and requirements to get three engines ready for the next mission, and then we would just leapfrog the different vehicles. But, uh, of course, everyone likes to point out when this space shuttle was first designed that this flow was going to take 11 days. Right, yes. But uh, over time, on the space program, with the human-rated space program, whenever there was an issue, it required action. It required testing, inspections. And over time, this list kept growing. And once you add a test, once you add an inspection, it's very difficult and probably not smart to try to delete it. You know, so you would, each test that we incorporated. So over time, this became more and more... Uh, a longer list of things to do so i think it was back in the early 90s we actually took a proposal to nasa instead of doing all this work uh, that we had to do in between turnarounds for engines on the vehicle we found out it was actually quicker to take the three engines out and work on them offline we had a nice engine shop that we had developed there uh in the in the vehicle assembly building and later a separate building by itself and we would do all the testing uh, out, offline, and so when a vehicle came back, all the other systems could do their work, and just before they're ready to roll out, we would install the three engines, do a minimum of testing, but all three engines that we installed were ready for flight, checked out. All we had to do was do the interfaces, and that worked out really good. But we had, to, as you can see this list, there was a lot of things to do. Whenever you uh, did an inspection, if you broke a joint, opened a joint up, you had to verify that it wasn't leaking, so there's leak checks involved with every broken joint. And over time, we had some problems with some uh, 
high pressure oxidizer turbo pumps over the years. And so every time we saw a problem, we, or like we talked about when Dick Carlson or Eric Garzi or Dan Hausman would find a problem, data problem, we'd say, well, let's take a look at that after mission. And we said, you know, it's a good idea to look at it every time. And so we would do all those inspections hmm. and get it ready. So when it was when it was installed, it was ready to fly. Yes, that's so just the attention to detail, folks, is what made this the great engine reusable. Marty, where were you on this stair step of things oh. in there? After the engines were installed in the orbiter, we would do the testing for a engine checkout and then get involved with the launch mm -hmm. countdown. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Um, so we're going to bring your model in here. And don't be uh, all these charts and so forth I'm giving to our stay curious friends out there. Just sort of you all to digest a little bit. I'm going to, uh, we're going to go this. Marty will might zoom in a little bit. Dan, or Kevin, if Kevin. you just put it right there. Yeah, Kevin. I, okay. Uh, but um, Kevin, you're doing an awesome job. I think everybody out there, I see Marty writing down a lot of people from around the world watching us here. I'm sure Robert Law is watching in Dundee, Scotland. Oh, okay. And uh, we've got friends in Australia. Uh, 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 we've got uh, friends in Ophelia is probably watching in Normandy, France. Uh, but uh, uh, So Marty's going to zoom in a little bit on this as uh, you take us through some of the pieces and parts of this. Well, let's do a five-minute SSME 101. There you go. Let's start with the fuel system. Fuel system comes in, the fuel comes in to the low pressure fuel turbo pump, and this is where we interface with the orbiter. Fuel comes from the external tank through the orbiter MPS system and interfaces here. Fuel comes in, basically at the inlet, you know, all you're seeing is the head pressure or the weight of the column of hydrogen to this point, which over time comes around. Just showing you yeah. the, how detailed that is there. And so it comes around. Uh, through the low pressure duct comes through these flu fuel flow meters which I have here I haven't painted them yet but that's what those are comes into the high pressure fuel turbo pump that you talked about high pressure fuel turbo pump uh, actually turned at 37,000 rpm it was pretty big this actually stepped the pressure up from a couple hundred psi coming out of the low pressure pump up to 6,000 wow. psi coming out of the high pressure fuel turbo pump when it comes out of the high pressure fuel turbo pump it comes and it's split into three coolant loops through this diffuser, we call it. The three coolant loops, the main, uh, the main one is the fuel actually goes, comes around through the chamber coolant valve and actually feeds the, uh, the pre-burners. Mm -hmm. And the, like I said, this is a fuel rich, so there's a lot more hydrogen in the pre-burners than there is oxygen for complete combustion. But we'll get back to that a little bit later. After it goes through the pump, it um, comes down and it actually cools the nozzle. If you can see these three, we call these the steer horns. There are three of them around and they're built into two and the, the fuel comes down and comes up the nozzles. This, uh, this nozzle is made of tubes and I've kind of shown that in this in this model through these tubes. There are 1,080 tubes and that cold- 1,080 tubes. 1,080 wow. tubes. It actually, the fuel, turns into somewhat of a gas from a liquid, but it starts at the minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit, like you said, and it actually cools the nozzle. That's required because the main combustion chamber burns at 6,000 uh, PSI and 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. So any metals would not stand up to that. So the nozzle is cooled that way. Another coolant loop is a separate tap off, comes out of this diffuser and goes to the main combustion chamber. And that is shown right here through this line. And it has a separate cool loop to, to cool the really hot area where the rubber meets the road in the rocket engine, right there at the main combustion chamber, right there at the throat. There's a, uh, another coolant loop that, uh, that uh, is tapped off, and it turns the gas and it actually drives. And you can see this duct right here. This is what drives the fuel turbo pump. We tape a little bit of that uh, hot gas that's, that is warmed up. Mm -hmm. actually expands and provides us with a lot of energy. So we use that to spin the low pressure turbo pump. So at the end, the fuel comes in and it uh, is a lot of it is dumped into the to the uh, pre-burners. Mm -hmm. Is that a term redactive? What am I thinking? How, where you're harvesting? Regenerative. Re regenerative, yeah. okay. This is a regenerative nozzle. Okay. And, uh, and it actually the phase change does a lot of cooling. 
And so this is fuel rich. So let's go to the, ox the oxygen side. What a beautiful model, though. Yeah. Yes, everybody's enjoying so that. We have the low sure. pressure, again, the low pressure locks duct or uh -huh. locks pump. Is up at the top of yeah. the lower enters. All right. This low pressure lock pump works at about 5,000 RPM. It doesn't work quite as hard, but. Uh, 5,000 RPM is not working. Well, as compared compare to the other, <laughs> the other pieces that we see. So it comes down to the low pressure duct, comes around, it it comes past this pogo. And if we got a minute, we'll talk about this pogo device right here. And, and we'll talk about it now. This pogo device actually is an accumulator that absorbs and dampens any pressure spikes or variants that you get in the flow of oxygen. Oxygen is a very heavy liquid. If you hold up a, a, a gallon of water, for instance, you know, the, the gallon of water is going to be about eight, $8 a gallon, 80 pounds a gallon, but uh, oxygen is much heavier. So you any spike through that is a water hammer kind of effect that comes through there. So this pogo uh, absorbs all that. Mm -hmm. So it, you go into the high pressure oxidizer the turbo pump. You're talking about it. Yeah, the looks like a. So it's kind of like a condenser, then, huh? Well, an accumulator is a good word okay. for it. It's actually an accumulator, and it absorbs any pressure variance. And if we have more time, that came. That was an offspring of something we saw on the Apollo program. It really wasn't an issue with SSME because we didn't have such a tall stack, mm -hmm. and we, we didn't have the the liquid hammers or water. We call them water hammers, but it was oxygen, and it would come in and it would do some damage sometimes. So this is just absorb it mm. and be like a an accumulator. So this high pressure oxidizer turbo pump turned it over to 20, uh, 22,000 RPM. It uh, is pumping a lot heavier liquid. And out of the uh, uh, high pressure oxidizer turbo pump, we had a couple tap offs. One tap off is it's tapped off and this duct right here comes around and actually drives the low pressure oxidizer turbo pump. Mm -hmm. When it's that finished, right there you're talking yeah, about when that. it's finished driving that duct, that uh, pump, it actually gets back into the main flow again. There's another tap off, off the uh, just before the main oxidizer valve, and this tap off is ducted back into the bottom of the high pressure oxidizer turbo pump. And there's another high pressure pump at the bottom here, that runs on the same uh, shaft as the main pump, but it pumps the, uh, it increases the pressure to over 7,000 psi, and that oxidizer. And this is kind of important. This oxidizer then comes out of this duct after it's been boosted to a high pressure and comes up to these two these two areas, to the pre-burner. And this is actually the oxidizer that feeds the pre-burners. Now, as we said earlier, the engine is a fuel rich. So you saw a lot of fuel being dumped into the pre-burners, but a very little bit of oxygen. And so when it's burnt, it reacts just like a mini rocket engine. Mm -hmm. it's a, and it but it, it's not complete combustion because it uses all the oxygen in the combustion, but it has a lot of extra fuel in it. And so it turns that into a hot gas that's very fuel rich. So that fuel rich material, after it, it, it explodes and expands, it turns the turbines on these two high pressure pumps. And then it, that hot gas is then ducted out of that turbine through these through these crossover ducts into the main combustion chamber and it's this hot gas that actually serves as the fuel in the main combustion chamber so that's what makes it very efficient it, it doesn't waste any fuel earlier versions of rocket engines they had gas generators and they would do the same kind of thing they would tap, tap a little bit of fuel a little bit of oxygen off the side and then spin the pump turbines but mm -hmm. then they would duck that overboard and you're wasting a lot of energy. You're wasting some energy, mm -hmm. and and but it was very simple and it made things operable. This SSME decided to save all the energy from all of the propellants and and burn it through a fuel-rich technique and actually spin these pumps and serve as the fuel. Now that's the simplified version because there are tap-offs, there are the fuel and oxidizer are going all over the place, but uh, that's basically the operation. That is amazing, to the harvesting, in my layman's term, is all this stuff. What are, what are those right there? Well, see, that's that's another... F oh, these little white things right there. Yeah, yeah so if, uh, if anyone who's that familiar with it knows, these are the actuators, the thrust vector control actuators that actually steer 
the engine. I, I know, said really, that's how it can move. Yeah, so yeah. not only is it throttable, it's, huh? it's, it's, this engine is steerable. Yes. And when you, when you uh, attach this to the engine, you have these actuators, these thrust vector control actuators that would actually push and pull, and you could gimbal the engine in two planes, so you can basically... Up to like go, 11 degrees. 11 degrees. Like this, it would, the maximum yeah. I had. And so you would push it, and all the three engines had this, so they would all gimbal in the same direction. And that, that was one of my favorite parts of the liftoff, is when you saw the engines mm -hmm. gimbal with the with all of your... your it's it's fueled up, being mm -hmm. cooled down, and so forth. And it's very smart. That, they're going to be going now. They're gimbling the engine. When you know we're in the gimbal test, we're getting close. Yeah. And so that yeah, but see, people who are true rocket scientists would understand that when this engine had the red GSC when it's not installed, we never installed the uh, TVC actuators on the GSC, and you never saw this. But I thought for my model, I wanted to have TVCs involved, just so you could see it. Well, there's the. Uh... The, the, there's the, uh, the uh, power heads there, kind of a close up of those. Yeah, so you can see how well, you can see how let's say I can, you can see how the uh, oxidizer is burnt a little bit in both pre burners, in both this pre burner and the other one. Okay. And that that exhaust from from the work it does to turn the turbines actually serves as a fuel in the main combustion chamber. That is. Uh, you know, uh, what would uh, what would Robert Goddard think of this engine? I think he'd uh, be we love talking about Robert, Robert Goddard, Marty mm -hmm. and I. He would, I uh, think, be very impressed. I think he'd be happy, and I think he'd be validated that he, uh, you know, he was a shy person. And uh, I think he'd be validated that his work actually amounted to something because uh, he was a great proponent of liquid propellant. There was a lot of talk about, you know, going to solid propellant a lot of times, which I like to refer to as fireworks. Yeah, exactly. But the liquid yeah, propellant, solid rocket booster, and and when he saw bottle rockets, yeah, if he saw that we were using hydrogen, which in his day was, you know, just out of reach. In fact, the hydrogen really wasn't in reach till just before the space shuttle main engines. It was just such a difficult fuel to use that uh, several companies had trouble with it. Pratt Whitney was an expert in in hydrogen uh, pumping, and it turned out Rocketdyne was really good at it too. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another Carlton Bailey shot of liftoff there. I should have showed the sparklers going on. A layperson like me, until I came here to the museum, didn't understand wow. that at T minus uh, 10 seconds, these sparklers are starting to go off there. Uh, and then uh, the engines are ignited six, Marty, 6.6 .6 seconds before? 6.3. 6.3. Tell us about that pre-ignition of everything and, and why that was important. Well, just before, before the SSRBs go at zero, yeah. then there's no turning back. Just before uh, liftoff, Ed, like Marty said, 0. 6.6 6 seconds, the uh, the engines were started one at a time. We didn't want to, because there's so much liquid moving, you didn't want to start all three at the same time. You want to do one at a time to get the fluid going so you wouldn't, you know, put too much of a vacuum on the external tank in the MPS system. So they were stepped up. I think the 6.6, the next one was at uh, another uh, 1.2 seconds after that, and the third engine started 1.2 seconds after that one. So they stepped into it. But what happens is the uh, fuel hits, it just with a head pressure, hits the low-pressure pumps, and the main fuel valve and main oxidizer valves are opened, and it kind of bootstraps itself. Now, if you take a look, and this is one of the problems we had developing the SSME was the start sequence, because all these valves, you didn't want to flood the different areas with propellants. They had to come in, in a mixture ratio, and you wanted to kind of start slow and step it up. So the, the actually the design of the final start sequence was a nightmare hmm. for a high pressure engine like this. So it, at the main fuel valve and main LOX valve, they would open, but just before that, we had a lot of purges. We didn't want to see a lot of hydrogen venting in the area. As you know, hydrogen is very explosive over a wide range of environmental conditions. So you wanted to uh, not have an open air detonation of a bubble, a gas bubble of hydrogen. So the uh, system, they developed a system called the ROFI system. And I can't remember what ROFI stands for, but they were the- R-O-F- R-O-F-I. Okay. And it was like, 
rapid Orient oxygen the, firing. Well, the, the, I know it, it's it's like <laughs> making it's, stuff. Up. It's but the, they they actually were were Rofi. sparklers. What they did, they were igniters. That in case a small gas bubble had mm -hmm. appeared, they would ignite in small amounts. You could, wouldn't allow a big explosion, but you would burn off the hot the the mm -hmm. hydrogen in small amounts and that's all they did the sparkler things the there. Sparkler, it's like taking a cap off of a gas can and the gas vapors pool over there in the corner and you throw a match in there poof you could have a bad situation yeah and, and like i said gaseous hydrogen is very explosive over a wide range and you don't want a, a contained explosion of hydrogen so those rofies did that actually we kind of touched over it but in the pre-burners there's we do have spark igniters and they that they burn off uh they turn on just at engine start, and they run for about four and a half seconds, and they just get the pre-burner started. Once you start the fire, it's like lighting mm -hmm. a candle. This thing will, will stay lit. But getting back to the start sequence, all these valves, they open and close, and they're very precise because you want to start sequence through experience. We came up with a sequence to make sure it started smoothly. Electrical impulses uh, open those valves? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, they're they're okay. actually hydraulic valves. Some but, valves are pyrotechnics on bigger things, but well, I wouldn't imagine. No, that. no, no. These these engines these are throttleable, so the valves open and close very okay. precisely. Right. And that's why we had several on-pad or RSLS aborts because if a, a, a valve didn't work precisely like it was supposed to, even though it was kind of keeping up, if it got outside the limits, we shut the engine down. Huh. Our good friend Charlie Walker, astronaut, was on that first. Uh, abort in yeah, there, and, so, uh, he said that was the ultimate pucker factor for him. Yeah, we would like to apologize. <laughs> I, I used to run into we apologize. Uh, I'll tell Charlie you can apologize yeah, for that. That's Charlie. Cool. Why I've had dinner with Charlie, and he he mentioned that to me once. Yeah, um, he'll we, be in town in a month, and yeah. and uh, we'll probably go out to dinner with him. I don't we'll know if you remember us, but we would we would sit with him and his friend uh, Jim Rose. We would sit and have dinner together. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, looks uh, like Marty's got a question over there. Comment. Maybe someone in the audience knows what Rofi stands for. More of a comment. You may want to mention that it's these, although I'm mentioning it, uh, these are the three main engines that throttle down when you hit max Q. When you hear the word throttle down. And, yes. And that we're going, but Marty, that's a good way to perfectly to segue into this chart there of the nine minute, uh, basically about nine, eight and a half minutes mm -hmm. of the uh, SSMEs going. And, uh, uh, you can kind of be briefly take us through that and there's what's called a thrust bucket the thrust that bucket. i've understood so yeah so this engine ran for 512 seconds and another thing that we used to joke about in the firing room with uh, john plowden and dan hausman and eric garzi was the one true sign of a good rocket scientist was they could hold their breath for 512 seconds <laughs> so that's what you had to do is hold your breath for that first 512 seconds the thrust almost you can, 10 minutes 10 minutes folks, and you can see at the start you see the the thrust coming up very slowly on this chart and so that's what we were talking about it, it has to come up very slowly you don't want to flood the areas with too much fuel too much oxidizer you want to step it up and these pumps have to kick start as we showed earlier both low, low pressure pumps are fed and driven by output from the lower pumps so it has to come up come up slowly and then we get to to uh, 100 percent thrust and at 100 percent thrust within the 6.6 .6 seconds we got to 100 percent thrust about half that time and when they came up to the full thrust we would send a signal to the space shuttle orbiter to say we're 100 percent thrust we'll go for launch and that the computer on board the orbiter made the decision go or no go at that time and that's what gave the go to srbs to ignite once these came up to full thrust and so we would take off we would do a um, tower clear and would run for some time and then uh, i guess after about a minute and 10 seconds or a minute and 20 seconds um, because the aerodynamic forces on the vehicle what we call max q and max q is not so much it will just not speed by itself and not just atmospheric pressure by itself but the two kind of mixing together when the speed of the orbital got so great and you were still in kind of relatively low atmosphere it would put the most stress on the vehicle and that's what we called the max q so to get around max q to not have the the vehicle shake apart or put, to have undue stress on it we actually throttled this vehicle to these engines down and that was done through this these two valves here the opov oxidizer pre-burner oxidizer valve and the oxidizer and the 
uh, fuel preburner oxidizer valve, and they're both are what throttles the engine down. They control the turbine speeds and the high pressure pumps. And so we would throttle down to 65%, and that would slow the vehicle down noticeably if you were on board the vehicle, and I think you had a friend. Winston Scott, astronaut, said mm -hmm. it, it. He talked about the thrust bucket, where you were inside the bucket, they said, because you're slowing down. And he said you could feel the, the, the vehicle slow down and then kick back up again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even though this engine is a... Super, you're, you're going a 1,000 miles an hour at that point. It, it's not like if you see pictures of what they saw on staging on things like the F, uh, the Apollo program. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were they were right. really tougher. But yeah, this was sure. a... Most of the astronauts felt about 3 Gs. And when you're sitting back in your chair and you're feeling 3 Gs, and all of a sudden you only feel 1.5 Gs, you feel like, you, well, maybe I'm floating a little bit. Uh -huh. But then after we get through the max Q... And we'd get higher, but our speed would still be increasing, but we'd be higher out of the atmosphere. There wasn't so much air. There was not enough pressure. So we'd throttle back up. And, of course, those are some famous words you hear, go with throttle up. And and so that's what that meant. We'd mm -hmm. throttle three, these three engines back up to 100%, and they even go to 109%, depending on the mission, to give us some extra kick. And so uh, that's what we called the thrust bucket. Mm -hmm. And then what we would do is we would just run these engines all out, and the astronauts in the vehicle would feel about a constant 3 Gs. Even after SRB separation, they'd just feel the 3 Gs. And then as we got close to orbit, we actually would play with the throttles because we would get a signal from the orbiter to our main engine controller, which actually was the, the brains of the engine, which told it what to do, when to throttle, and what throttle. And it actually did all the other things, like controlled the, the throttling valves as a closed-loop control. Mm -hmm. We would actually, as we, if we kept driving this at 109%, the astronauts would ex exceed the three Gs. So we actually saw some throttling down just before orbit and just before shutdown, depending on the payload, the weight, the atmospheric mm -hmm. conditions. We would throttle this to get us to get us into orbit and shut down the engine at Miko. Now, Kevin, explain to us how you can get more than 100%. Well, what you do, do it's easy. What you do is you rate the, the engine, you design the engine, design the parts, the wall thicknesses, the structural members, the flow rates around what our target was. Mm -hmm. And our target was about uh, 375,000 pounds of thrust at sea level. Okay. Now, when you're at altitude, that uh, increases because you can get more thrust out of a, an engine at, at altitude. And so what we did was... During all the testing we did, we did a lot of testing on this engines. We would test and see, well, let's see, let's see if we can get it to go a little bit faster, a little, a little bit more thrust. And we would, we would do the math. We had to do a lot of analysis to make sure the wall thicknesses, the flow rates could handle it. Mm -hmm. And through not only mathematically, analytically verifying that we could go at a, at a higher percentage, we actually did a lot of engine testing on the ground where we pushed the engine to that. And after we satisfied the requirements to show analytically and demonstratively in a test stand, we could go to 109%. We did that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think people, when we first started, I think we aimed at 104%. And then, you know, people would ask the question, well, what if we went to 110%? And so we did all that, that analysis, and it was determined 109% was a sweet spot. And hmm. so we, we actually rated this engine to, at a higher thrust over time, but we still went off the original requirements at the 375,000 pounds of thrust. Very, thank you. Perfectly explained to me. Now I understand that. That's, uh, you can get 109% uh, out of an engine. I'm not sure you can out of a football player. Okay, uh, <laughs> they say give us 110% today and, <laughs> and that sort of thing. So. Marty, we've got a lot of people watching today. Why don't you read off a few of those names on our UCAC family microphone there, please. Too many for me. <clears throat> okay, we have, uh, i got to put my glasses on. I'm afraid there's going to be some of my Rocketdyne comrades who are yeah, going think to so. point out. Yeah, Iglesias Bassini, Tom really? Schultz, Nick Herrera, Lawrence Scarlett, Anna Joe, Dave Stange, these are the names we know. Carlton Bailey, Tom Usiak, Cynthia Rossi, Gary Folsom, Robert McLennan, the Titusville Area Chamber of Commerce, hmm. Space Monkey, Doug Forrest, Gary Jarrell, 
He's a oh, say, that, say that last name again. Jero? Gary Jero. Oh, Gary Jero. Yeah, he's a, yeah. a, a Vidalia onion farmer in yeah. uh, Georgia. One of Collins, Georgia. In fact. One of Marty and I's old friends, avionics engineer for Rock Dane, used to be Kelly Jero. So that's what. I thought oh, okay. Yeah. Well, okay. We also have uh, Carol Cavanaugh. I think I said Bill Carol Cavanaugh. Yeah, yeah. Carol Cavanaugh. Hello, Thank Carol. Thank you for watching, Carol. And Larry Pushkar, Tom Celentano, Tony Achilles. And Neil ten thirty, you know ten Tony Achilles. Good to see you chiming in there. All, uh, lots of them are, are regulars that watch our video podcast. Does any one of them know what Rofi stands for? Anyone know it? Rofi R O F I. I remember. Oh, Tom Musiak's probably. You know, it's radio out, radio outgoing. Uh, fuel igniter, radio outward. That's what the sparklers were yeah, talking radio about. Radio outward, radio fuel igniter. outward. Fuel igniters. Oh, firing igniters. Firing igniters. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I, I, it came back to me. See what happens when you, you've been retired so long. Still, it came well, back. We appreciate you all watching. I am. You are doing an awesome job, Kevin, of explaining uh, rocket engines and main simplicity. He's got a beautiful 3D model that he's done. Uh, and, and when you look at the engine, there's a box on it that's the computer part. And, Marty, you had something. That, that's what your part of it, right, yeah. uh, on, on the engines there. Just fascinating how what I call harvest their own energy to uh, move the um, uh, rotors and stuff like that. But we want to talk a little bit, Kevin, about this picture behind us here uh, was taken at uh, this uh, uh, testing a... Uh, a mature design not just testing them in their infancy but uh one of the one of the success stories of the ssmes uh is their ability to that you constantly investigated issues resolved anomalies that's what this uh chart is all about here uh verify and increase the operational envelope uh malfunction testing to demonstrate redundancy over test to demonstrate safety margins and that was all done at this facility here that you've been out there a few times i imagine oh yes especially when you're assigned to vandenberg we didn't have any real hardware there so i spent a big part of my early career at stennis uh stennis outside of huntsville alabama well actually through I mean, the south actually just outside of slide yeah right yeah, yeah slide louisiana yeah. Yeah, i'm wrong yeah it's on i-10 uh, near the Infinity Museum of Fred Hayes That's is right. where you mm -hmm. take your tour from. And I had a roommate from Slidell mm -hmm. in college, uh, yeah. Louisiana. Slidell, there. Louisiana. We, so uh, we, we had to test a lot. One is to, uh, we called it green run, because these engines were reusable. Each part would have to be green run, which means accepted into the, uh, into the flight program by being actually tested on the test stand. So we had several of these engines, of these 46 engines I talked about, were constantly being tested, not for testing the engine, but verifying components, individual components. Each component on this engine, as it was brought into the, uh, the inventory, had to pass three green runs. And so mm -hmm. we did a lot of green run testing, which is part of that, all the seconds we put on it. We just talked about the requirements to test this to 109 percent well part of that was what you had mentioned you know limit testing seeing how we can go above to spread the envelope of the engine and then of course whenever there was a malfunction we would try to recreate it on an engine at the test stand very controlled and you could put instrument special instrumentation on this to investigate any any uh, anomaly that you saw in the data for instance when a valve we we had a couple on pad rs ls aborts and mm -hmm. what we do is we take that valve off that failed and we'd ship it to Stennis. They would put it on the engine currently in the stand and try to recreate it and know what caused the problem so we could solve it and never have it happen again. So, and, and again, just to keep the engine, to make sure we understood the engine, you have to understand that this engine was developed in the uh, late, golly, late 70s or late 60s. The uh, contract was awarded in 71, and we were still using slide rules in those days. Wow, so, yes. you know, you, through the engine testing, you got to know the engine intimately well and how things interacted and what key characteristics you saw, how they were, there was something to worry about or something not to worry about. So I think you had the number. How many seconds of test did this 
and flight that these engines have through this whole crew, the whole program? One million nine hundred, one million ninety five, and one million ninety five hundred ninety five thousand six hundred seventy seven seconds, according to this chart here. Glad you asked, Kevin. <laughs> and that makes it the most tested engine out there. Yeah, you're. Uh, the hot fires. So you're saying that every SSME engine before it went on a space shuttle mission uh, had three green run tests. So each, so that's nine minutes over well, nine minutes. Well, what, what happened is, what happened was to get an engine started, we would do just a short test to get it, uh, just a couple of seconds to get it the main stage, to make sure it got the main stage, and then we we dry it and get it ready. And the next uh, was a, a longer test. Get in the main stage and and try to get some valve movement, and then the final approval for Green Run was running the engine at a full 512 seconds. Wow! So before they were put in the aft of a shuttle. Before. And you dealt with OV103 almost exclusively. Well, in, in part of my discovery, career, yeah, part of my uh, career was that's all I did was follow. Which was the workhorse for 39 missions on there. So, uh, but uh, yeah, that that chart I know you can't read all that on there, but uh, I I broke it down that in the uh, SSME start in, uh, of its uh, test there at Stennis, they've got uh, 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 18,261 minutes, which is 304 hours or five solid days of running uh, these uh, uh, an, an engine. is That's just incredible for nine minutes. That's really... Uh, and then that lends itself to this. Uh, uh, what we have up there is the... Um, Conclusions about testing. Uh, testing is necessary even on a mature, well-understood production engine. Acceptance of testing sometimes reveals issues in new hardware. Some problems do not present themselves until late in production. When you're building four dozen engines, uh, some design features, like mating of certain components, for example, can only be demonstrated during a hot fire. And some issues are vehicle driven or are related to flight operations that change outside the engine's program's control. So, mm -hmm. can I ask you where you got those charts? Uh, the official charts. Pratt Whitney. Mm -hmm. a, a Pratt Whitney. Uh, uh, I can show you where that is. A woman well, and a man. Uh, their their analysis of the engines after the program there. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I found these really helpful. And then the lessons learned uh, is. Uh, is a result of the relentless pursuit of improvement, and that's kind of like a, a a Boeing, you know, mantra there, I guess, huh? Well, you know, safety was number one, and I'm pleased to say that, uh, you know, that the workforce out there was always focused on safety first. Drive for understanding, and I love this. Fix problems, don't manage the problems. Uh, incorporate multiple changes. Uh, you had like th four or five different block engines throughout the the 30-year uh, program of that. But yeah, fixed problems don't manage them, like some systems of the space shuttle were, which will go unma unnamed. They uh, tried to manage some of the problems there, and it, and it, it bit them. Uh, what, what kind of new uh, technology? Uh, I mean, off the top, you know, analytical tools, materials are key to the SSME success. Well, Bottling has always been very important because you can analytically try to determine what would happen if you change some uh, characteristic or some, you know, some measurement on the engine. You see what its effects are downstream. Uh, but like I said, there's always some room for improvement. Uh, I can tell you on the Space Shuttle Main Engine Controller, the controller that runs this, when I first started the program, that controller weighed 208 pounds. It had 4K of memory on it. 4K, wow. And it uh, it was highly reliable, but by the time technology is uh, approved and incorporated into a human-rated space program, it's already obsolete technology. So, you know, during the engine testing and during the evolution, the controller was, was stepped up several times, and one of the improvements they've done to separate this from an SSME to the RS-25 on the Artemis is the controller. They actually have a digital controller on there now. And uh, I don't think it, it's not as robust, but it doesn't need to be because it's only going to fly once. 
Mm -hmm. But uh, there you go. Yeah. That's so that shows you the evolution. So even though the outer mold line of this engine looks the same, there were constant improvements, tweaks, adjustments to it. Uh, there was a time when we used to make this high pressure fuel duct out of titanium. I think now mm -hmm. they determined mm -hmm. since it's since it's going to uh, Artemis, I think they just made that out of stainless steel now. One of the, the changes. You mean since it's going to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean? Yeah, built, yeah. <laughs> and you, 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 my heart. you hate thinking about yeah. that. I mean, yeah, really, what do, what do you feel about that? It's like, are these like your children sort of thing in, in, in a rocket uh, engineer's world? Of well, one thing you'll find when you, when you talk to any of the rocket diners, it was, it was a, a family of men and women who had an extreme pride in their product. And uh, it was our life for a long time. And it was the lives, just about everybody, it was their life. And so it was a, a real camaraderie. And like I said, it was competitive because, uh, like I said, just hanging around smart people all the time. Mm -hmm. It is very competitive, and it sorted out the good from the bad real quick. I mean, good competitive within, oh, within yeah. the, uh, uh, the engineering of, yeah. of your clique there. Uh -huh. And pe people were recognized at the Rocketdyne for their, their intelligence or their, their ability mm -hmm. to understand the engine and their hard work. And so there was a real pride in the, in the profession on this engine and it became our lives and it is an engine to be proud of like you said all the statistics and even now you can see you know people point out well there's the engines are made cheaper uh elon musk's engines are extremely reliable but you have to remember this was made this was designed by slide rules it was uh yeah. heavily managed by a committee and uh, uh elon enjoys you know newer technology so i really think that the the folks who made the, the merlin engine so incredibly reliable actually stand on the shoulders of people like dick carlson and and lee solid and john plowden and garzy and hausman and the the whole generation kevin hoststrasser there yeah, no no i'm a, no 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 but you're holding up the guys yeah, that are holding up the other guys. that's exactly yeah, what the, okay you know, that's exactly uh, what that tell you, you know, there's got to be someone at the bottom of the pile that, kevin that was okay me. that was me. there you're we're way too humble you have but really me. done a great job and i know our state curious <laughs> listeners have really enjoyed this uh hour is just breezed by here Kevin, we certainly will have you back. Maybe we'll have you and, and uh, uh, Dan Hausman on together. And, well, I'll be quiet uh, during that session. Uh, well, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> if I'm uh, smart, I'll keep like, quiet. Like, uh, like Kevin's been emphasizing, uh, there's a beautiful shot of the SSMEs working at the edge of space there. Like you said, they afforded you an opportunity to play around with them a little bit, huh? Mm -hmm. To see what maximum you could get out of them there. If you Just talk to any astronauts, they'll say that was the smoothest ride that ever make a point to ask them when you see them because once you separate the srbs this was one smooth ride oh this is like a sports car most of them say that's the fuel tank by the way taken up there with them but these ssmes designed by slide rules in the 1960s 50 years later are strapped on to the bottom of a, another rocket tube the space launch system that uh, uh you know they're going to uh ditch them in the ocean all that beautiful manicuring over three decades of these engines um i think i find that very interesting but they can tell exactly what shuttle missions all these engines of artemis one went on there you shows you some of them there how it was configured um and the rocket launched by mark usiak mark thank you for sharing your photography with us two brothers tom and mark usiak Photographs over 60 of your shuttle launches. Mm -hmm. They live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and become great friends of our museum there. Uh, but this rocket engine's the 50 year technology, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, with, of course, the modern upgrades, like you said, a digital computer and so forth. Um, it's still basically the same engine, same technology, and a lot of smart people with slide rules figuring out the combustion ratio and and the, the flows and the thermodynamics required to get this effective. And that's what you have 50 years later when you have pride in your craft of what you do, which I love the competition you say was among your engineers. It reminds me of the news business that I was in because some of my favorite memories in my working career are in a couple newspaper bullpens uh, where we were all alpha dog men and women wanting to get that, mm -hmm. our story on the front page. Or, or type mm -hmm. of thing, you know, and, and it, it, it instilled in me particularly a, a, a positive competitiveness to do my best mm -hmm. 
uh, at all times and yes. exceed expectations. In a family atmosphere, that's what it was. In a family atmosphere. And with absolutely. families, you, you get some, you get some of this. You get, uh -huh. but there in all families. But it was very, uh, very rewarding to work at Rocketdyne and the Rocketdyne people. Well, Marty's Grummies were a lot like that. I think I don't know how competitive you all were, but you all had pride in your craft too. Marty, you got a question there. You've got a question from Dave Stangy. Kevin, how do you feel about these engines now ending up in the ocean? It breaks my heart. As an individual, I have to go with the, you know, the, the nation's, you know, directive to, to go to this way. And if it gets into a whole other topic, but the history of that decision being made, the uh, NASA decided instead of going to, you know, a new development, since we have a, a million seconds on this engine, it was cheaper, smarter, faster to go ahead and use something that they knew and modify the MPS system of a rocket to go with it. It also broke our hearts. For a long time, we always had Russian engines on site. They didn't launch space shows, but they launched expendables. And having Russian engines on site always rubbed me the wrong way, too, mm -hmm. because this is, you know, it, it's a, the knowledge of rockets is something that we want to keep, you know, U.S. leadership in. And when you decide to buy cheap Russian rockets that were very reliable, you know, RD-180 was a very reliable engine, and boy, was it cheap. They could buy a whole slew of them mm -hmm. for just one of these. Of course, that was expendable. And uh, so it broke my heart to, to see Russian engines being launched in the United States, but it also to still breaks my heart to see these go into the ocean. But that's the national directive, and we'll go with it. Well, there'll be a few of them left over, I think. Uh, you said there was, uh, we're down to 14 left, right? And there was already some, I think, all the museums that, really would honor having them already have them so not too many of them need to be saved yeah well marty uh we've certainly enjoyed this do you have any questions for kevin one of your working colleagues there so we got robert law i told you he'd be up enjoying his evening cocktail uh <laughs> in dundee scotland and uh, maurice krasowski uh he is in europe somewhere i forget i've looked that up and uh, I'll, I'll look that up again, but we've got a, a lot of people that enjoyed this conversation, uh, Kevin. You did an outstanding job of taking some rocket science stuff and very very easy to understand. Is there something uh, we didn't ask you that you'd like to share with our viewers today? Mm, no, the only thing I, I guess when we talk, the next time we talk, we'll go into SSME 501, more details about how engines work and combustion ratios and the physics of it. Sure, well, we'd be but, happy uh, to do no, that. No, I've got the... And, and uh, uh, we'd be happy to do that. You're always welcome to come back here. We look forward to seeing but you. Would... Again, you've got some other models. Uh, you've got the, uh, the uh, with the air spike, they called it. Yeah, I've got an F1, 1 to 12 scale, and 1 to, to 18 scale. I've got a linear aero spike and the annual aero spike. And just for fun, I uh, designed and 3D printed a uh, BE4 engine. BE4 the, is the the, the Bezos engine Bezos for the, engine for this New Glenn be, for New Glenn and also being used on the uh, ULA uh, Vulcan rocket. Okay, all right. Well, hey, well, I loved his little diagram there. We can do that a couple times there with these engines there. I, I would like yeah. to add, I really admire the work that you folks do here at the, the American Space Museum and the dedication of all the volunteers and the people who work here. Really, I really admire that. Well, thank you very much. How do you find our Artifacts in our humble little museum. It brings back here. a lot of happy memories sitting at a console. The C-12 there yes. that you mentioned, right? Sitting with Marty. Fueling the shift, station. waiting, for you, just watching the controller, pressure and temperature. You know, three days out from launch, that was my job. Yeah. Sitting there with Marty and trying to, with uh, uh, George Page in, in his office, making sure that no one ate <laughs> or read newspapers in the firing room <laughs> you know the good old days he's the first launch director for Great the guy. shuttle also a, a, an apollo icon mm -hmm. in there uh it, it there's a lot of characters in there and and uh unique personalities that checker our wonderful american space program and Kevin, we're so happy that you're here to share. Thank you very much. Uh, share it with us. No, thank you. Uh, this was a a very interesting talk. Uh, Dan Houseman, you got your work cut out for you when we invite you back here. But no, we'll uh, look at your 3D models there in more detail there. But Kevin, thank you for a wonderful Stay Curious program. Marty, a flawless job on your end there. I know we had a lot of people watching today and uh, they can watch it on YouTube. Tell your friends and family that the American Space Museum brings to you 
people that we call national treasures, like Kevin here, Kevin Hostasser and Marty Winkle uh, worked on these programs intimately. They were just one of thousands of people involved that made it work, but nonetheless, we're pleased that they could share their story on Stay Curious today. Thank you again. We hope to have you back, Kevin. Until then, I'm Mark Marquette saying tomorrow's Wednesday, Hump Day. I'm going to talk about the planet Venus that's going to be disappearing in our western sky. And if you look at it through binoculars, it looks like a crescent moon. And it's at its brightest phase. We're going to talk about that. Uh, the sun acting up. And we're going to give you some more auction items as Saturday. There's another important auction for the American Space Museum. Believe it. You better believe it that we keep our doors open with the money from these auctions. So we'll be sharing with you some of the 370 items that Mr. Chuck Jeffrey is going to be auctioning off as our uh, uh, collections manager, or, uh, collections analyst here at our American Space Museum. So until then, Kevin, thanks again. Marty, thank you. I am Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you tomorrow to bridge the space between us.